Greetings, JC here for Interface, and this is the beginning of a series called Stereo 101. In this series of videos, we're going to take a look at each component in a home stereo system. We'll start with the stereo receiver. It is the heart of a home stereo system. It is where everything is plugged in, and it's where all the audio is amplified and sent to your speakers from. Stereo receivers can be quite complicated. Stereo receivers that are made for home theater systems with surround sound and multi-channels are known as home theater receivers. For this video, we're going to talk about the basic two-channel stereo receivers. The first thing that we need to understand about stereo receivers is the name receiver and what it really means. Many people who come to high-end home audio for the first time can get a bit confused about all the different names of the different components. A stereo receiver is actually three components built into one. This very high-end technique system we're looking at here has a power amplifier, a pre-amplifier, and a tuner. The tuner is self-explanatory. It's used to tune in radio stations on the AM and FM band. The pre-amplifier is a box that allows you to hook all of your inputs up. It controls the volume of the system. It controls the EQ. And the power amplifier is the final stage that is used to boost the signal to a level where it can be used by the speakers. In very high-end systems, these are three separate components, and that allows you to mix and match different components to suit your speakers or to suit your needs. But most of us will do fine with a standard stereo receiver, where all three components are combined into one. So how do you know exactly what you're looking at if you're in a thrift store or looking at an eBay auction? Well, a power amplifier is pretty easy to spot. Usually they have one input and speaker outputs, and that's it. Some have big meters on the front of them that show you the wattage that's actually being driven to the speakers. If the box you're looking at is not labeled specifically as a pre-amplifier or integrated amplifier, an integrated amplifier being an amplifier that has the preamp and power amp in the same box, you can usually pick them out pretty quick by taking a peek around the back. They have lots of audio inputs, and they may have two or three audio outputs, but they do not have any provision for speakers at all. This is a preamplifier from Parasound. When stereo buffs get together, you'll hear them talking about their amplifiers and receivers, and wattage inevitably comes up. What do these numbers actually mean? Well, wattage is basically an expression of the power the amplifier generates as it amplifies a small signal to a larger signal that can be used to drive a set of loudspeakers. It's expressed in watts. The more watts an amplifier has, the louder it will be. However, higher wattages do not necessarily mean better audio. Wattage is simply an expression of the power an amplifier produces. It doesn't tell you anything about what the audio sounds like or how much distortion the amplifier is producing as it does the job of amplifying the signal. Wattage is usually expressed as an RMS value. RMS stands for root mean square. It's a fancy way of calculating the average power of an AC signal. Audio is alternating current. Another power rating that you'll see listed occasionally is peak power. This is the maximum amount of power an amplifier can handle for a very short time, as in when the audio peaks. Somebody hits a loud drum, a singer sings a loud note. This is also sometimes called music power by some manufacturers. And music power or peak power ratings can be very much higher than the RMS value generated by an amplifier. Basically, you need to look at the per channel rating on an amplifier first. An amplifier can be referred to as being a 100 watt amplifier. If it has two channels though, it may only be producing 50 watts for each speaker you hook up. For home theater systems, this can get very complicated. An amplifier could be said to be 500 watts, but the per channel rating is divided up between six channels. So the actual punch that comes from each speaker is lower than what you'd expect from a 500 watt amplifier. Generally, the power of an amplifier should be twice as much as the lowest listed wattage that a speaker can handle. 
Speakers are rated in ranges, and if you look at the back of a speaker, you may see it says anything from 20 to 150 watts. Therefore, that particular speaker would benefit from an amplifier that was producing at least 40 watts RMS. There's a myth in audio that you should actually go the other way. If the speaker is rated for 100 watts, you should use a 50 watt amplifier. The thinking is that you will never be able to overdrive the speaker and blow it up. However, the truth of the matter is putting a wimpy amplifier on a speaker that is expecting more wattage is a sure way to blow up both the amplifier and the speaker. If you turn it up too loud, the speaker will draw too much power. This will fry the power stage in the amplifier and can also fry the voice coils in the speaker. It's always better to have a much more powerful amplifier than the speaker is rated for. The more, the better. Another number to be aware of when looking at receivers and speakers is impedance. Speakers are usually rated at 8 ohms. That's pretty standard. However, there are 4 ohm speakers and 16 ohm speakers out there. Some amplifiers have ratings listed on the back or in the manual for different impedances of speakers. Pay attention to these. If you have a 4 ohm set of speakers, make sure the amplifier can handle them and make sure that the wattage at 4 ohms matches your speakers. It's never a good idea to mix different impedances in speakers. In other words, if you have two pairs of stereo speakers hooked to your amplifier, one on A and one on B, and you intend to drive them simultaneously, it's not a good idea to have one set that's 4 ohms and another that's 8. Now that we've talked about the numbers, let's talk about functionality. This is a great graphic from the homecinemaguide.com, and it shows the basic inputs and outputs on the back of an amplifier. We know this is an amplifier and not a receiver because there's an input for a tuner. Starting on the left, we have a dedicated phono input. This input is designed to take the low-level signal directly from a magnetic phono cartridge. It provides special amplification and equalization that a turntable needs. This is a dedicated input and can only be used with a turntable. Plugging a CD player into this input would produce a very loud and very distorted signal. The line level inputs on this amplifier are labeled tuner, CD, and DVD. However, any line level device can be plugged in here, from an iPod to the output from a tape deck. This amplifier has two tape loops. They're referred to as tape loops because a signal can be sent to a tape recorder, CDR, or mini disc recorder and monitored through the machine as it comes back to the amplifier. The input from a tape loop is used to listen to the tape. In amplifiers with two tape loops, it's usually set up so that tape one can feed a signal to tape two, which will allow you to dub a mini disc to tape or tape to mini disc or whatever you're trying to do. A great accessory to have for your receiver if you start running short of inputs is a switch box that will allow you to plug components into it and plug the output of the switch box into a line level input on your receiver. This way you can plug even more stuff in. Let's talk a little bit about what you'll need to get connected and up and running with your stereo receiver. Components are hooked to the receiver using RCA cable. This is coaxial unbalanced audio cable. Coaxial means that the cable has a center conductor which is surrounded by a shield. They're referred to as RCA cables because they have RCA plugs on either end. Most stereo components come supplied with cables, however they tend to be rather short. If your components are going to be located some distance away from the receiver, you may need to invest in extension cables or buy longer cables. However, be careful. Really long runs of unbalanced RCA cable can pick up hum and interference. The next thing you'll need to consider is speaker wire. Speaker wire is used to connect the speakers to the receiver, and how much you'll need depends on how many sets of speakers you plan to hook up and where they're going to be located. You might want to have a set close to the receiver and another in another room, so plan accordingly. A great source for speaker cable is the hardware store. Look for lamp cord or zip cord. Now I know there's a lot of audiophiles out there who will disagree with me and they'll say that you'll need wires that are specially designed for audio. I say, eh, that's not necessarily true. 
18 gauge braided copper wire is perfect for carrying audio and you can get it in long lengths for a very low price. The next thing to consider are antennas. If you plan to use the radio a lot on your receiver, you'll need to make sure that you have the proper antennas. Most new receivers come with antennas supplied, but you may want to upgrade. For AM, a simple loop antenna is usually perfectly acceptable. Older receivers can have an AM bar antenna that's built onto the back of a receiver. If you really want to get jazzy, you can set up an outdoor antenna for AM, and there's usually terminals on the back of the receiver that allow you to add an antenna if the receiver already has one built in. The next thing to consider is an FM antenna. You'll probably do most of your serious music listening to FM radio. And a great set of rabbit ears is perfect for this. You can go crazy and set up an outdoor antenna if you like, but that tends to be rather complicated, and in most areas, a good set of rabbit ears is all you're going to need. Getting your rabbit ears connected may involve getting some adapters. If the back of your receiver has a 75 ohm input F connector, and your rabbit ears have twin lead 300 ohm wires, you'll need one of these. If your antenna has a 75 ohm coaxial lead with an F connector and your receiver has a 300 ohm input, you'll need to get one of these adapters to make sure that they hook together properly. Whether you're looking for a new receiver or you plan to find a vintage receiver from eBay or a thrift store, I hope this video has helped you to understand some of the basics of this complicated stereo component. Stereo 101 will continue next week with a video talking about the basics of CD players. For Interface, I'm JC. Yeah.